Uh, thank you. Yeah, going last at a conference like this is very intimidating. I feel like Sasha is trolling me to put me in this position, but that's okay. We're here. So, um, yeah, and these presentations have been incredible. Uh, admittedly, I, I missed yesterday, but this is my excuse. This has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, but I was painting 15-foot tall type in my hometown in Ohio, and I was stranded in Pittsburgh yesterday at the airport, but um, with a good typographic excuse. So I'm sorry for missing yesterday, but um, I, I do want to sort of like get this out of the way. Um, and, and as was mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm not a type designer. Um, I don't design type for a living. Um, so really uh, what I'm sort of talking about today is coming from the perspective of the two companies um, that I co-founded. Um, so Order is a design office and Standards Manual um, is a publishing imprint. Um, what that means is that we do graphic design and publish books. Um, so just a little bit of background and, and context uh, to those two uh, different companies. So this is some of the work that we do at Order, so a lot of brand identities, design systems um, for a pretty broad range of clients. Uh, so this is for a music publishing company called Song Trust, um, designed by Garrett Corcoran in our office. Um, and then also, you know, other clients like uh, Higher Education. This is a project we worked um, on uh, for Williams College uh, with Lucas Sharp uh, and his foundry, um, doing a bunch of custom type uh, for them. So I'll talk a little bit about that and how it impacted um, the foundry that we started. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about standards manual, but there are some lessons that I think we learned about um, making objects, uh, in this case they're physical objects, um, and selling them uh, you know, to a, a large audience and, and distributing them. I think distribution has a lot to do both with um, book publishing and uh, font distribution. Um, and these two images uh, are from the last book that we published. Again, don't really have any relationship to this talk, but I thought it was cool because they took place in this room. So this is from the New York City subway debate um, when the map was introduced uh, by Vignelli and the debate between him and Taryn around which uh, map is better. So I just thought this was cool that we're in the same room as these images. Um, okay, so between these two different companies, they've, um, you know, uh, one was started in 2014, uh, the publishing imprint, the other uh, was started in 2017, and they've, they've both grown and sort of extended beyond themselves. And so, um, like was mentioned, uh, Standards Manual has sort of extended into this, this new additional company called Standards, where we're building a um, sort of a, a digital tool to build uh, brand guidelines. Um, and the same thing has happened pretty recently with Order, um, where we um, established a little type foundry um, very simply called order type foundry. Um, so this is really what I'm talking about today. Um, so this question about why start a type foundry, um, I sort of had a really easy answer to that, which was why not? And that's sort of like a, an easy way out, and I don't think that's, that's really true. I think the real reason um, to, for us to start a type foundry um, at least I personally believe that type is identity, and that's really what we're doing at Order. We're developing identities for organizations and companies and, and other people um, and what they want to do. So um, I think that's really why we started this. And just to give you some background about myself and, and how I came to truly believe that, um, I started my career um, at the Museum of Modern Art um, under Julia Hoffman, who was the creative director there. And you know, I, I don't think I really realized it uh, at the time, but you know, MoMA's identity is just strictly typographic, um, and it really uh, reinforces the imagery and the artwork that um, they showcase in the museum. Um, so, you know, MoMA has sort of a, an in-house style um, you know, that was uh, in Franklin Gothic and now has, has changed from that. Um, and once you're inside of the museum, the exhibitions themselves have their own identities, and um, this is one that I got to work on sort of on the sixth floor of MoMA. If, if, you, if you go there, that's sort of like the, the main exhibition hall. Um, so when we developed you know, identities for um, the exhibitions, they're really in support of the artwork itself. And so we don't use a lot of photography or you know, illustration, other sort of uh, um, imagery heavy devices. So we use typography. And so this is, was, was a, uh, sort of a, a woodblock inspired um, identity for German expressionism. Um, so I started at MoMA, and then a year and a half later, I went to work for Michael Beirut at Pentagram, um, and he's uh, very much a champion of this idea as well. And so his um, approach and his method is very much typographically driven when it comes to developing brands and identities. So this is for a restaurant um, that was in Washington, D.C., um, called On Rye. Um, and then things like this. So, you know, this is for the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, 
one of uh, the clients that I, I overtook when I started there. Um, and this was just a sign to tell you to not let your dogs poop on the lawn. Um, but for their identity, I mean, they had this Frederick Gowdy sort of typeface called Divine, um, and that is the inherent identity of, uh, of the cathedral. There is a logo, and it has sort of a rose window um, symbol to it, but the, the typeface is the identity of the place. Um, and then lastly, you know, at, at Pentagram, when I was, uh, you know, there, I got to work with Michael on the Hillary Clinton um, campaign, and this was the first time that I realized which, by the way, is not like a new concept or something that you know was uh, was revolutionary, but that I, that I experienced where you could commission and work with uh, another type designer on a project. I, I had never done that before. I think I did the standard thing of you know licensing typefaces and using them out of the box, which is great, and we still do that. Um, but for that campaign, we um, uh, worked with Lucas Sharp um, to essentially just do a custom version of, um, of of Sharp Sands. But this was the first time that. I I, I collaborated with a type designer and modified something to make it inherently unique to the, the client. Um, so this was really exciting and really fun, and it was just sort of an eye-opening experience for me. So um, now at Order, we do very similar things where we'll work with um, other foundries and type designers uh, to bring our identities to life. Um, this is for a company called JustWorks. Um, if you live in New York, you probably see their ads on the train, and uh, we're a customer of theirs. They handle our payroll and HR. Um, but with, for this project, we worked with Colophon Foundry out of the UK um, and really gave them a brief. And by the way, we also sort of established this with the client um, from the outset. So we said, or they came to us, said we want to do an identity refresh, and we sort of proposed, let's do a custom typeface from the very beginning rather than sort of uh, coming to the coming to that conclusion um, within the process. So um, it's a long story, but basically the, the inspiration for the type came from uh, mechanical uh, catalogs and sort of like watch mechanics and these very utilitarian machine parts. Um, and so this typeface called Oatly was designed. Um, it only had three different weights to it, a regular, a bold, and a display. Um, and in this case, it's, it's not a revival typeface. It's uh, simply inspired by a collection of different typefaces um, that creates uh, the identity in and of itself. And so for this you know, identity and this brand, um, there's, there's really no photography, there's no illustration, it's strictly typographic. Um, so when we develop the brand guidelines, it's basically a typographic manual, um, but you know, we, we sort of call them uh, brand guidelines. Um, but it's really in support of, of type. Um, and so in that case, we worked with the foundry, and then we started to um, do projects on our own that um, supported custom type. And so this was for a wool blanket company. Um, and one of the designers on our team, Emily Claby, um, she really looked into the history of this particular company, which has a long history, unlike JustWorks, which is a fairly you know, new and, and young organization. Um, but in this case, you know, Chatham Blanket um, has been around for you know, almost uh, a century, and they had um, sort of decades and decades of different typographic material that we could pull from. And so we collected all these samples and found a very strong presence of this slab serif. And then first, we just created sort of a, a custom logo Type that almost looked exactly like it did, you know, 50 years ago. But then we went one step further and created a single weight typeface called Chatham Slab, um, and this is it. So there's no other uh, weights or supporting italics or a text weight. Um, but we really started to see that we could do this in house, um, which just made it a lot easier and fun for us. So again, the, the guidelines become. Uh, typographically driven um, instead of photographic or, Ill or illustrative. Um, so that's a little bit of background about our foundry and, and what, what we do day to day. Um, but here's where the sort of story comes into development for um, why we started the foundry. So in summer of 2020, you know, the dark times of the pandemic, um, there was a group of type designers, uh, at least one of them, if not all of them, are probably in this room, um, that would get together and just drink outside um, every Every Thursday and just talk about type. And so one of my friends, uh, Rory Sims, he's another graphic designer and um, he has been in the type uh, program here at Cooper. Um, he invited me to come along. And so, I mean, I feel like I'm an imposter in this room, but really within this sort of very tight group of uh, t designers and type designers, um, they let me sort of sit in and just talk about typography. And I was just interested in, um, you know, the medium of that, but they really got into details that, um, that I couldn't even sort of uh, contribute to. Um, 
I've been sworn to secrecy about the location of where this happens because I think it's still um, a place that, uh, you know, not like would be utilized. But, um, you know, every week a new flyer would be made and um, would be sent out. Um, and so this is the actual location of it, even though it's a blurry photograph. And as uh, Benjamin Tuttle puts it, it's a feral cat trash park under a bridge. Um, so that's the place where we really started to talk about type. And it could be about anything, about the mechanics of it, about typefaces that people are uh, interested in, showing each other the typefaces that they were designing. I wasn't designing anything. And so Ben did show me seven typefaces that he had uh, just designed and said they all got rejected from uh, a particular foundry who will remain anonymous. Um, and I was like, oh, well, let me see the type. I mean, like at Order, we're always doing projects that need you know, new typefaces and ones that we like to uh, license or sort of be the first to use it. So Ben showed me all of these typefaces, and I was sort of floored, only because they were so good. Um, and I just couldn't believe that they all got rejected from a foundry that he submitted them to. Um, so this started to get me thinking, well, if there are really talented type designers out there with essentially fully developed you know, families ready to go, um, is that, is there sort of an opportunity here to integrate that into order and almost just act as a distributor for typefaces that can't get into the, the larger foundries um, that, I, you know, are, are difficult to do so. Um, so Ben showed me those. At the same time, um, the same designer who did the Chatham blanket identity, um, Emily Clayby, she's also a type designer who's a, who's a full-time graphic designer on our team. Um, and between the two of them, and that sort of inspired me to just say, hey, let's just do this. Let's create a very small type foundry. Let's see what happens. But at least there's a place where we can distribute and sell typefaces that, um, that you know, other people um, might want that, that, that you design. Um, so this was the very beginning of it. We're big Notion users at Order. So we put together a really simple Notion page with a couple of Ben's typefaces and Emily's um, and really just started to think, you know, how, how, how is this going to work? Like, how can we do this? Um, so I talked very briefly to Terry at Grilly. I was given this advice, and I guess he was doing Zoom calls during the pandemic about how to start a foundry. Um, and he just said, you know, it's, you know, to start, you can just put up a PayPal link and then email the typefaces when people pay you. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be super scrappy. And so between that and what we had learned at Standards Manual, simply selling books, I figured if there's an add to cart button for a book, we can do the same thing for typefaces. Um, so I assigned this project to Emily because she was very inspirational in this entire endeavor, and she sort of knew what she was doing, and she's very excited about this. Um, so she just went like full in and went into Figma and designed essentially a mini sort of extension site um, for the foundry that lives on orders uh, on our, our portfolio website. Um, and then the, the foundry was, was born, I suppose. And so we have three you know, primary goals, and that's sort of growing as, as, we, as we move on. Um, but the first one is to extend the historical research uh, that we do at Order. So as you can probably tell, we dig a lot into the history of either a company or an industry that they're in, and that extends into the identity that we put forward. So that's the same here. Um, we really want to support new, young, and emerging type designers, probably everybody in this room. And I encourage you all to send us the type that you're working on for us to take a look. Um, and then we just wanted another, you know, you're the client project. So standards manual, we are the client. We get to do whatever we want. We don't have a quota of publishing. And for this, we, we don't have to release you know, X amount of typefaces per year. We're simply doing this for fun, and hopefully that's the reason why all of us are here. Um, so speaking of fun, we have a couple office dogs. Um, this is Frank and Penny. So they became our not deaf glyph. And so Emily designed this, and that's where we started. And that's very cute. Um, and then we launched with uh, two typefaces of Ben's, um, so plebeian and pastiche grotesque. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through them. I mean, you can see these online, but um, pastiche grotesque is five different weights. It's sort of this combination, as Ben described it, as how sort of if Helvetica and Franklin Gothic had a baby, this is what you would get. And then, you know, being graphic designers, we just like to make um, sort of stuff with them. So these are all fake case studies that we sort of made up a, a client and sort of, uh, you know, instead of 
a, a regular sort of vector specimen, we um, just put them on stuff. So three different weights of foam and, and printed material. Um, and then for plebeian, there's, there's 10 weights to it. So there are you know, five Roman, and then there are the italics. Um, and we did the same thing. So we thought this would just be a fun project also for the studio and for the designers to take the typefaces that we're um, uh, distributing and then make these little case studies using all the amazing uh, sort of mock-ups that are available today. Um, so this has been really fun. And then just recently, we, we started to make merch and some carpenter pencils and t-shirts. Um, and so uh, just you know, sort of to get into the second half of this, um, to talk a little bit about our process. In the beginning, it was just myself and, and sort of Emily uh, you know, finding type designers and talking about it just amongst ourselves. But now we've made it more collaborative within the studio itself. And so um, there's basically two phases that happens when we decide to release um, a typeface. Um, so the first phase happens in five different steps, where there's a discovery of just looking at what, what's out there. Uh, once we find something we're interested in, we'll reach out to that person. Um, we have a discussion with them. And then Emily and I sort of do an internal debrief. Um, and then we bring it to our, our Slack and post things in there and then talk about it on our weekly call, calls as a group discussion. And if everyone sort of agrees, then we move forward into phase two, which is a little bit more logistical and just like figuring out how this is going to be released. And you know, Emily really put together a great release plan and all these different requirements um, to get to the finish line for mastering and launch. Um, and there's one very critical step to this group discussion uh, that follows a very um, you know, scientific method, which we call the stone cold method. And so if this guy shows up and he gets a big hell yeah, that's when we know that a typeface is uh, ready to be um, put into the world. So one of those typefaces um, is by another Emily on our team, Emily Atwood. I think probably a lot of people know her in this room. Um, and so this is the, the s a few sketches of Etude, um, an upcoming release that we are putting out of hers. Um, and I'm not even going to try to get into the nitty gritty explanation of this typeface. And you'll see it um, on Wednesday when we release it. But it's essentially inspired by a broad nibs uh, musical notations um, that she discovered and really went in depth, um, sort of uh, you know, pulling inspiration from this and the forms. And so what you get are uh, three different weights um, that were released and hopefully maybe in the future there will also be italics that accompany it. Um, and then it has this sort of you know, stencil quality that she also incorporated into the, the typeface. And you know, she found that also in combination with the broad nib sort of notations that um, stencils were also used in that method of uh, musical notation. And so um, you know, it's a really beautiful typeface and one that I think also sort of is in line with, uh, I don't know, the method of order and sort of these different various components um, in the most simplest terms and um, also bringing them into a sort of a full system. So this is sort of a diagram of the different components within the stencil typeface and the relationship and how that um, sort of manifests itself. Um, so because it's a stencil, uh, we actually made one. So um, along with the merch for the, the foundry, we're also making um, sort of uh, family-specific uh, merchandise for every um, typeface that we release. And so this is for sale now. And then these are a few examples of that in use. Um, I think we made up a, a fake, a fake uh, philharmonic for this one um, and just did various materials that dealt with music to sort of showcase um, the typeface. So really beautiful you know, tickets. This is uh, one that's not making it to the website, but I just loved it on these different sort of pedals, and I thought this was really beautiful. So um, that's, that's really all I have. Um, so I just wanted to sort of thank the team that helped bring this together. I didn't do much beyond sort of say, I think we should make a foundry, but a lot of other people actually did the work. Um, so again, Emily Claby, who put together the website, you know, most of the case studies, really sort of like hit this out of the park um, and made it uh, come to be. I've mentioned uh, Ben so far, so really great collaborator um, on the first two typefaces that we've released, um, and Emily Atwood, um, who we're releasing the third typeface from, and then Alphabet Type, who does all of our mastering. So um, with that, I'll just leave you with the idea to go start a foundry yourself, and that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks.